and gentlemen, a cordial welcome uh, to the second presentation, the second talk in our uh, EC Game Changer series, Viewing Earth from Space, the Changing Environment and Climate of Our Planet. My name is Michael Rast. I'm the Earth Sciences Director at the International Space Science Institute EC in Bern. And particularly and cordially, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Annette Bartsch, who will be uh, giving this presentation today, entitled Changing Northern Lands, Thawing Ground and Expanding Use. Um, Dr. Annette Bartsch is a remote sensing scientist with expertise in cryospheric research and hydrology. And she's focusing in that on the geographical region of the Arctic, where she is looking at observing climate change impact, specifically um, the understanding um, of impacts of permafrost thaw on carbon release. She's been publishing a lot um, on that subject and particularly also presenting uh, new approaches and applications in that area. Annette received her Masters of Science and Geography at the University of, of Jena and made her PhD at the University of Reading in UK and Herbenia Docenti or Legendis at uh, the University, uh, Technical University in Vienna, Austria. Uh, but she's also um, been at the University of uh, Salzburg and at the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich. She's founded uh, the company um, BGOS. Um, which is also focusing on that research. And with that, Annette, I'd like to welcome you again and uh, give you the floor. Thank you very much for the introduction. So my talk will be about uh, climate change in the Arctic. I didn't put this into the title because when people read this, what they expect is actually uh, something about um, sea ice or maybe ice sheets. And that's not really what I'm going to talk about. I will start with this. Uh, so we know sea ice, that's something what we can, uh, well, first of all, uh, really nicely observe with satellites. And we have learned a lot about sea ice from uh, using satellite data. And sea ice has been declining uh, to a, a really uh, huge extent. It's, it's, um, and it has been declining continuously. So if we look at that here, that's a just over more than 20 years period, the summer minimum, we see a really strong decline in sea ice. But that's not uh, the only um, impact of climate change in the Arctic. So these uh, temp uh, change increasing temperatures, they also have an impact on the land. And the, the temperature of, of the land surface and the ground beneath. And in the Arctic, we have, or actually on the Northern Hemisphere, about 25% is actually affected by permafrost. So this is a permanently frozen ground. Uh, so we have frozen ground for at least uh, two years in a row by definition. And this, uh, so and it's, it's a kind of, it's an answer of what is happening in the atmosphere. So with this increasing temperatures, we also see uh, temperatures increasing in the ground and the extent of permafrost decreasing. And this is what we can see here in addition uh, to the sea ice in, this, in, this, in these figures. And it's uh, maybe not so, it doesn't really jump to the eye like the sea ice. Uh, you have to look careful and it's, it's at the rims. Uh, there's this, this blue area, dark blue area, what we call a continuous permafrost. And then we have this transition zone. So it's discontinuous sporadic to, to isolated. So these lighter blue colors. And if you look at these, these rims of the, this, this area or the blue area, you see that actually things have been changing. And this area, the permafrost extent has been declining. And not just uh, at some places across the Arctic, it's really all, all around the, the Arctic. The southern boundary has moved northwards. So, but it's not just the boundary of the permafrost which is changing, it's the, these temperatures are changing everywhere, also in, in this uh, dark blue area, in this continuous permafrost. 
And actually, specifically along the coast, we really see strong increases in, in ground temperature. So now when I'm talking about ground temperature, I usually refer to a temperature at two meter depth. And these uh, very wet areas, when we go back to the sea ice, so that's actually these areas where we see this really strong difference in sea ice extent. That's also the coasts uh, adjacent to this. Those are the areas where we also see an extremely incre a high increase in, in ground temperatures. And the, like the, the far eastern Siberia, it's, it's still very cold permafrost. It can be like minus 10 degrees, but it's uh, continuously the temperatures are increasing. So it's kind of foreseeable that also these regions will, will become permafrost free uh, at, at some point. Uh, that's a bit different uh, way to look at it, a time series. Again, something from sea ice, that's September sea ice X10, uh, a figure that many of you may, are maybe aware of, these type of figures. But let's uh, add permafrost to this figure. And what we see, well, well we see sea ice X10 uh, declining, and we see the temperatures in the ground increasing. So and that's uh, it's increasing continuously. This uh, that's uh, the data here for the ground temperature that's uh, coming from the European Space Agency Climate Change Initiative. Um, and well, I come back later to this uh, and explain a little bit more how we actually get uh, to this to this uh, to these numbers. But what is really important about the Arctic is and permafrost is that there's a lot of carbon in the soils. So this is uh, figures just showing the, the upper two meters of carbon, but there is uh, lots of carbon even, even below that. And the, big question, the question is what is going to happen to this, to this carbon uh, when it becomes, when the temperatures go above zero degree and microbes start to act and then uh, this carbon is released into the atmosphere as either CO2 or methane. So we have um, uh, the, on top of permafrost, what's also quite interesting to look at, it's this so-called active layer. So actually the ground is thawing every, every year. So during summer, a few decimeter to two meters, depending on where you are. And uh, this uh, so-called active layer, it's also increasing um, with um, increasing air temperatures. And that's also something what we can, can look at. And this, uh, this, this active layer thickness, it has been increasing on an average for the Northern hemisphere, uh, but on uh, 2.5 centimeters within a, uh, on a decadal scale. And in some areas, uh, this, num this number is even quite higher. So it has been uh, increasing uh, across most parts of the Arctic and well, people are worried about what is now going to happen to this, this, uh, this carbon, which is now uh, in the soils, which is now not frozen anymore. Yeah, so that's the, the, the climate change side. And then in addition, we also have, actually we have lots of people living in the Arctic. There are more than 5 million people uh, living on permafrost. And uh, just uh, if we think about this area close to the coasts, there are more than 1 million people living uh, along the coast. So we have quite a lot of human presence. And this is something uh, what we have been looking into as well, because there's some, uh, well, that's of interest for risk assessment studies. So what does it mean for infrastructure uh, on permafrost? but also other way around, what, what is the impact of human presence on, uh, on permafrost? So that's something that we have been looking into with uh, uh, satellite data, Copernicus, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 data. And the most of it, so these, these patterns, what you see here, these darker red areas, that's mostly related to oil, gas industry, mining, and in some cases also military presence. 
So I, actually, I've shown you the results first, but now we need to look into how, how do we get to, to these nice figures, to these, to these results. Well, there's a clear added value of using satellite data to monitor thawing ground and to monitor the use uh, land cover, land use in the Arctic. And there are different ways how we can, there, there are a number of challenges here um, that we need to tackle. So it's not so straightforward, especially if you're thinking about um, permafrost, because permafrost is a subsurface phenomenon. And we cannot look into the ground. So what we would I actually want to know is the temperature beneath the surface, yeah, whether it's increasing or decreasing. And uh, yeah, as we cannot look into this, uh, we have to we have to find a different way to get to these numbers. And uh, one way is to to model the ground temperatures. And we can do this because we can what we can measure from space is the, the, the land surface temperature. So we can use the thermal information observed by satellites to, to see how this, the skin of the surface uh, is uh, behaving, how these temperatures are increasing. And then this information, so, um, the way how this is translated into the ground, uh, it depends on soil properties, vegetation, and specifically during winter, the snow cover. So a deep snow cover means that uh, well the, the, the signal is not so well translated into the ground so that we even can have a decoupling of ground temperature and air temperature and so on. And vegetation and snow, this is something what we can observe from satellite. So this information can, can be used to, to parameterize the, the heat transfer in, in the model. So that's, uh, so you take the land surface temperature and these other observables from space and then uh, feed the model. And then you can get uh, here in this case, it's uh, what we call a transient model, which provides us time slices. So with that, we can uh, derive numbers for a certain year, certain time of the year. And we can derive the temperature of certain of the several depths. And usually we use these two meter depth to characterize permafrost. And you can also, with this type of these type of models, you can identify this uh, active layer thickness. So the active layer that's characterized here in this figure by these red areas with the blue uh, line below. So that's uh, the representing the, the, the seasonal thaw depth. And yeah, how how well does this work? Well, it's um, well that. The way what we can compare it to is, for example, a traditional mapping. So that's on the left. Um, that's basically uh, hand-drawn information. There's expert knowledge going in here, and in in some areas, um, yeah, there's more detailed knowledge here. And then you see other areas like large parts of Canada here. Uh, that's not so. That's very generalized. It's it's, it's just yeah, straight straight lines. So this, this map on the left, that's uh, the IPA, the International Permafrost Association map. That's the current standard still. And uh, it's, yeah, what is, has been mostly used until today. But as we see from the model, there are actually, well, there are differences here. And uh, yeah, so we, from the model, we get a much, much uh, higher detail. And yeah, what is the, has been what is actually a challenge for this traditional mapping is uh, you only know the temperature here from boreholes, and there's a very this borehole network is actually uh, rather sparse. There's really good uh, borehole network in in Alaska, but elsewhere we have we know very little about the temperatures in in the ground. There are also some other approaches, other models uh, which I added here. There's one uh, like you can apply an equilibrium model. So we assume that there's no change over time. That's what we actually did before using the transient model. And, and then there's another alternative way uh, apart from the, the thermal information, it's to use um, radar, uh, satellite radar information 
because with the radar, you can see whether a surface is frozen or unfrozen. And then you sum up the frozen days, and this can also provide you an indication of where permafrost is and where not. But in this, that way, you use the, the, the seasonal amplitude and temperature range, but it gives you some approximation. Now, it's, it's quite uh, difficult to compare this if when you have the maps next to them. So uh, I put them now for an overlap animation. So that's our traditional mapping draw, uh, drawn map. And then on top of that, this uh, based on the land surface temperature measurements, and you see clearly see the differences. And while some of these differences come from the methodology, of course, but then this other map, it's more, it's already more than 20 years old. So we can assume that uh, this uh, shrinking of the permafrost area is, is related to also reflecting climate change. Then uh, that was, uh, that's the, the, the version based on the uh, radar information, but well, it's much coarser information, but it's gives similar results like uh, the, the land surface temperature based approach. And then of course we can, the, well, what we need to do, we need to compare this to, to reality, to real measurements of permafrost to these boreholes uh, measurements. And uh, these, the, um, the story or that what we see from the boreholes or what we know from the uh, boreholes is that these temperatures are increasing and the magnitude of change that we see in the boreholes is similar to what we actually get from the model. So that actually fits quite well. So that's, there are slight differences between regions, how temperatures are increasing, how steep this, this curve is, but in general, everywhere all across the, the Arctic, we see an increase in ground temperature. Yeah, so what, what does this mean? This, uh, what are these permafrost thaw impacts? Where we, there's this loss of carbon, which uh, has uh, feedbacks uh, to global climate. And then we have a lot of visible changes at the surface, uh, land cover change, terrain change. And then uh, uh, what we also face here, it's uh, uh, issues re regarding ground stability, and that's affecting people, affecting people uh, directly who live uh, in, in the Arctic. So you have to consider this uh, for, for yeah, uh, building house, for example. But then at the same time, what we can see as well from the satellites is it's a change in vegetation. We can see a greening. And the different types of sensors, they agree actually well with each other. Well, maybe not on the magnitude uh, in, in some regions uh, on the patterns, but uh, in general, if we look at the, the overall Arctic, uh, the, the, the Arctic is greening. So that's expressed of the, in this vegetation index, this NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, what is shown here in these graphs. The upper graph is uh, coming from the AVHR um, uh, set, uh, sensor. And the lower one from the MODIS uh, sensor from the Terran Aqua platforms. And the, uh, so we see these increasing, uh, overall increasing greening. Uh, and the, but there, if you look into it in more detail, there are at some locations which it's very local. And there's also browning. And that's related to. Uh, what we refer to usually as disturbances. They are landslides. We call them thaw slumps if they are related to permafrost. And there are several hundred thousands in the, in the Arctic. We don't know exactly yet how many there are, but they are really very common. And well, there's also coastal erosion. Uh, it can be several meters per, per many years in many places. And then in addition, we have uh, change of land cover, expanding use of the Arctic. Now this temperature change and greening, that's information we can get from sensors, which give us a comparably coarse 
resolution information, the order 500 to 1,000 uh, meters. We can go comparably far back in time, which is nice. We're looking at climate change. Um, but um, if it's about uh, disturbances, we need uh, information at a much better spatial detail. Yeah, so these uh, thaw slumps, well, they are comparably big if you're thinking about landslides, but uh, thinking in, in terms of spatial resolution, they are still uh, very small. And uh, also the uh, like infrastructure roads, uh, rail tracks, they are comparably narrow and you need a certain spatial resolution to, to detect that. And that's only recently became available from satellites, at least in a, in a good uh, and continuous uh, coverage. Uh, what, if, yeah, what's of interest in this context is all, all these Landsat missions uh, from US. They allow us to go comparably far back in time, but a suitable coverage for the Arctic that's we have that for since about 2000. And then there are the Sentinel-2 uh, uh, missions, which are of high interest here in this context, which give us a, a spatial detail of about 10 meter. Now that, uh, yeah, doesn't look so much different, this 30 meter and 10 meter, but it, it really makes a difference, uh, especially about these um, uh, disturbances uh, that we are interested in for, for uh, across the Arctic. For example, a thaw slump. So this outer, this, this black line is an outline of a, of a thaw slump, a landslide. And uh, uh, comparing this 30 meter to a 10 meter. If the 30 meter, well, that could be anything. And with the 10 meter, we already see there is something. It, it, there, is, there is something, yeah, it, it, it's much clearer. And then thinking about uh, infrastructure, it does, really make a difference. That's a, a typical pattern uh, for, for an oil field in, in the Arctic. So it's, it's, uh, still, it's still interesting to use this 30 meter data as I will show in a minute, um, but actually what we more need, uh, what is really has made a difference recently for, for us, it's the Sentinel missions. But uh, let's uh, first look into what you, uh, regarding Landsat, people still have been trying to use Landsat because it gives us this change over time. And uh, in some way, or, or what has been very popular was the use of, uh, the use of Google Earth Engine. And it's a comparison of two different studies, a slightly different approach to map uh, thaw slums. One on the left is a study from Canada. So they used the Google Earth Engine time-lapse data set for visualization. And then they took a group of students, group of students made a course out of it, and they manually selected the, the thaw slumps from the Landsat image. And that's uh, the result. So they detected uh, several thousand thaw slumps and published that in, in science communication. Then another uh, study they used, uh, well, uh, also Landsat, um, looked at Siberia. And here they derived the uh, trends vegetation trends change from Google of Engine, then yeah, filter that. There could, be, there could be other disturbances like fires or change of flakes, and then added, yeah, um, process this further with a machine learning approach. And with that method across uh, Siberia, I identified more than 50,000 thaw slums. Uh, but then those are still, still uh, regional accounts, so they are, yeah, they are probably many, many more of these fall slums across the Arctic. Then, uh, yeah, change of land cover due to people. Now, yeah, roads, if we want, we are looking here at log roads, buildings, um, so-called gravel pads related to oil, uh, gas industry, uh, open pit mining. And uh, thinking about a road, uh, these roads in the Arctic, they are comparably narrow. And with the 30 meter, you do not capture them. But with the 10 meter, we are just at the margin, we are just able to, to capture them. 
Still, the 30 meter information is not uh, is still something what we can use because it gives us some uh, inf idea about uh, the change of vegetation in the proximity. So when, if a road is built, in general, vegetation is removed. So I thought we have a, so a mixed pixel. We still get, uh, if there's a decline in, vegeta in a vegetation index, that might then uh, relate to a, a new infrastructure, or it mean, might mean new infrastructure. That was the approach that we have been following. So for the current state, uh, we've been fusing Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and uh, use some Copernicus facilities and uh, machine learning, deep learning, uh, several methods that we combined. Uh, and in the end, well, you, you in, usually you do not get around uh, some manual uh, interaction. So you need a certain workforce to uh, go through the data to do some quality control. So it's not really only using artificial intelligence is not working. You still need some, some uh, human interaction in the end. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, that th this kind of strategy allows to, to get an account of uh, uh, infrastructure across the Arctic. And then, uh, yeah, where you combine or you can combine this with this vegetation trend information um, from coming from this Landsat satellite. Um, just as some pictures, some examples, how this is uh, looking like when some infrastructure is built in on permafrost. You see in the background, this is actually a rail track. And the, uh, well, some vegetation, it's not only that vegetation has been removed, actually some thaw slums in the proximity have been triggered. Yeah, so you, you remove the vegetation cover, you, you, you disturb the system and then it starts, basically it starts thawing and in the, the front part, you see these white areas. So that, that's, that's just ice, it's pure ice there. And if you're going there on a sunny day, let's see if this movie is working. Yeah, it's just everything is just being melting around you. There, yeah, you have to really take care of your stuff. Uh, that's just three years later. So at some point, vegetation is recovering. Just uh, yeah, as a natural recovery, or um, what uh, usually when when like rail tracks or something or roads are built, what one can do is to to also uh, so do something about it or to put extra seeds there to, to stabilize these, uh, uh, these embankments. So we have, um, so it, we can, what we might see in these uh, vegetation trends. So if we see uh, for a road, a greening, it doesn't mean that the road goes, it's just that in the proximity, uh, some vegetation is recovering. Now in um, the color coding that I will use in some, some maps uh, later on is that we use red for areas of vegetation decline. And we have been going back to the year 2000. So this means all what is shown in red is, has, is new after yeah, 2000. And then everything what is uh, in green is, uh, has been, uh, yeah, has been built before 2000, and we see here some vegetation recovery in the proximity. That's an example from the Alaska, uh, the Alaska North Slope, the Prudhoe Bay oil field. And here, uh, well, this uh, we see a lot of green. So actually, before 2000, most of has already been there, but uh, there's this this red line and to the south. So some pipeline infrastructure has been. Uh, built here in that case. Then uh, related to mining, we have mines, for example, in Alaska here, uh, we see extension of mining areas and we see uh, also building of roads connecting these, these mining areas. Uh, so we, find, we see that actually in Canada, a, a lot of that in Russia and also uh, yeah, in, in Alaska. 
specifically what one can observe in Alaska that during the last uh, 20 years, uh, infrastructure uh, airports have been renewed, extended or built. Uh, you see these uh, red longer or straight uh, objects there, but also um, yeah, here in the case of Nome in the center, the, a lot of these of these patches relate to extended uh, gold mining in recent years. And uh, yeah, it's it's a bit difficult to make a, a map to to visualize this for the entire Arctic. That's one attempt, and you see some areas uh, which have more red than others. But basically, you see we see extension of infrastructure in most places, and a lot is in Western Siberia related to oil and gas industry, and but also some in Canada and Alaska. Uh, if we uh, link that to uh, youth industry, uh, it's, it's really clear that the majority of what change or of new infrastructure in the Arctic is uh, related to gas and oil industry and uh, only comparably little uh, compared to that for related to, to mining. Yeah, but... Um, this uh, infrastructure is built on permafrost, on, on ground that is fine. So we need, uh, there is uh, quite some interest in risk assessment studies and uh, uh, specifically climate models are used to say, see, uh, yeah, how will the temperatures change in the future and where are the regions where we need to take care about from also from an engineering perspective uh, regarding thawing ground. And uh, now, if we would assume that the trends that we see in this map here, if they would continue in the next decades uh, in the same, at the same rate, what actually would happen is uh, that most of, uh, or well, actually we see in, in most of these areas where there is in this infrastructure, we see increasing ground temperatures. And we see an increase in active layer thickness so this about two centimeter on average, we see for these, these areas and uh, yeah, also continuously increasing uh, ground temperatures. And uh, if we extrapolate this into the future to 2050, about 55% of this uh, infrastructure uh, along the Arctic coastline, that's only the Arctic coastline here, will be shifting to uh, uh, above zero degree ground temperature. And we, ident we found that uh, at least 15% of all this uh, infrastructure that we can see from space, yeah, we cannot really see everything, but what we can see with the Sentinel uh, data, it uh, corresponds to, to new uh, uh, infrastructure or human impact. And then uh, the, uh, what is usually used uh, for these risk assessment studies is uh, open street map. But actually what we found that in some areas, not even, uh, well, there is a lot of information missing in OpenStreetMap. So it might be good in other areas of the world, but uh, across the Arctic, it's very, it's, it's pretty incomplete. There's much more uh, infrastructure buildings than, than what is uh, uh, contained in, in OpenStreetMap. So there's a clear added value here from, for using the satellite data at South. Copernicus Sentinel, which is only have this 10 meter resolution. And uh, yeah, so we have uh, these disturbances, well, we, which are occurring um, all across the region. So we have this uh, some, some impact disturbance by, by people, but uh, also these um, uh, many of these thaw slams. And then in addition, we have changes which are not so jumping to the eye or which are not so visible and which you are also don't really see when you are there. So something what is typical for permafrost regions is, is, the, is that the ground is every summer is subsiding a little, just a few centimeter. And then it's increasing when it's freezing, it's in the, the, the surface is increasing again, just a few centimeters. 
it's, it's very difficult to measure and it's nothing that you notice when you are there. That's something what we can only for a large bridge, but that we can derive from using satellites. So what is happening is that we have, um, well, we have uh, ice in the pores of the soil and uh, ice has a larger volume than water. So when the, the surface is, is thawing slightly, we have, uh, uh, yeah, in the summer, uh, that's why the, the surface is subsiding. And then uh, when it's freezing again, it's the, the surface is going up in the winter after. And it's really with the satellite information or with the, the technique that we are using, it's, it's all interferometry. And that gives us a, a quite a good uh, account and shows these few centimeter change. And this uh, subsidence, it's really driven by, by the available heat. We can uh, represent this as some, uh, or we um, can express this as cumulative degree days of thaw. Uh, so that's just the uh, temperatures, uh, positive temperatures added up. So uh, the warmer uh, summer or unfrozen period was the, the more energy, of course, is available to, to thaw, uh, thaw the ground. And then the subsidence is also higher. Yeah? So in normal year, subsides may be three centimeter. And in the hot summer, it can be six or seven or even uh, can be even much higher. So here, that's that's a really um, nice thing to do with satellites. And uh, this type of displacement, if we connect that over several years, we might actually also be able to capture um, changes related to climate change. Because these uh, permafrost soils, they contain a lot of ice layers, ice lenses. And when there's a hot summer, an ice lens may, in the ground may start to melt. So that's then a much larger amount of water, which is flowing into some, uh, yeah, away. And then after, in the end, in the winter after, the terrain is not, uh, is at a lower level as than before. And this is uh, something, if we are able to uh, append several years, what depends on the wavelength uh, uh, available, and we need a, a rather long wavelength here, which is not disturbed by vegetation, for example. So we can, we can identify this, this um, permanent lowering of the surface. That's an example for Greenland, where there's not so much vegetation. And uh, we see here this lowering of the ground. It's getting deeper, deeper from year to year, what is most likely related to loss of ground ice as a response to uh, global warming. Uh, but what we would need in order to apply this for the, for the entire Arctic, it's uh, uh, L-band information with a comparably long wavelength. And here future missions from Copernicus like Rose L or the very soon um, launched NISAR mission would be really important. Then something what I did not mention yet, it's the most, um, well, actually the traditional way of monitoring permafrost from space is to look at lakes. That's, that's what, how people used um, satellite data initially. And it started uh, about, uh, yeah, after 2000, there was one first paper about this in science in 2005. And then you saw uh, after that, there were lots of studies uh, doing this because we have millions of lakes across the Arctic, which are related to this change or this thawing uh, ground ice. So we call this thermocast uh, landscape, which is resulting from this uh, thawing ground ice. And it's, uh, yeah, we have a change in terrain and a change of land surface hydrology, what is then uh, yeah, visible by these lakes. But these lakes, they have, um, a natural cycle of thousands of years and they um, grow and disappear. There is, there's really a natural cycle, but it's um, with climate change, we expect this cycle to uh, accelerate and to see, depending on what the ground, the, the ice condition, uh, permafrost condition is below, uh, more in some areas, more uh, shrinking or more uh, increasing of lake cover. And that's where Landsat data have been used. 
uh, in the past to get an idea about the fact, uh, lake growth, for example. That's an uh, example from, from colleagues from the Alfred Wigner Institute. Uh, they tried to quantify this. Uh, you see these numbers here. They give an account of the lakes that they have been counting. And that, that's only some subsets. It's not even the entire Arctic. Uh, they use a machine learning approach for that. And uh, there's also lake loss at the same time. So we have uh, growth and loss, but it depends on where, where in, on permafrost where you are, how continuous the permafrost is. Uh, something to note here, that's a Landsat, so 30 meter. And uh, it will be really interesting in the future once we have more data from Sentinel-2 of the 10 meter, uh, it will be really interesting to see how this is changing because these, these lakes, they are really small. And uh, with the 30 meter, it's quite sure that many uh, ponds are, are not included in this account. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, thawing ground. Uh, that's the big question that we are trying to answer is what is happening with uh, all this carbon in the ground. We have this re the release of methane, we have release of CO2. And uh, yeah, so what is, um, so we, we expect with thermal cars, abrupt thaw, that a substantial amount of carbon uh, is uh, going into the atmosphere comparably rapidly. And uh, what is also of interest in this context or what is discussed a lot is the role of methane. Because uh, we have lots of wetlands across the Arctic and when it's wet, we have so-called anaerobic uh, conditions. What is, um, uh, yeah, frost or um, then resulting in, in methane emissions. So permafrost is discussed, considered as a tipping point in the climate system. Question is if we can use these, uh, we can use satellite data as for early warning. That's not so easy. It's not so straightforward in case of permafrost. What we can do is we can um, evaluate climate models. We can um, uh, we can also look into uh, or help to gain more process understanding. And there are several initiatives, uh, projects ongoing at the moment, just a few examples. Um, for example, uh, an ERC project, a Synergy Project QArctic, where we are trying to bring together people from remote sensing, from earth system modeling, in situ observations, and like regional quantification, what means uh, uh, atmospheric inversions, to um, gain uh, or, or to get a better understanding about the, the processes related to, to carbon release and what these uh, disturbances uh, in the Arctic, what, what, what they mean, what this uh, thaw means for global climate. Another initiative, interesting initiative in this context is a um, recently launched collaborative uh, community in it, initiative by the European Space Agency and NASA which is called AMPAC, the Arctic Methane and Permafrost Challenge. So that's really focusing on this uh, issue of methane emissions. And the question is, what are, what are actually sources and sinks across the Arctic? There are several working groups. So it's also here from the modeling side and from the observation side that we try to tackle this. And then also what would be requirements for future missions for satellite missions to, to help us to answer these questions and to monitor this uh, um, yeah, permafrost thaw. Uh, from the ESA side, this is coordinated for, for our, uh, the AMPACnet project that just had kickoff last week. So this is really something very new and uh, something what has just been started and we will involve uh, uh, the large uh, community and uh, one of the questions that we are trying to tackle is how we can use satellite data to better characterize the wetlands uh, in the Arctic, because they are, yeah, that, that, there are really high uncertainties here uh, in uh, how much uh, methane is actually emitted from natural wetlands or globally, but the Arctic, especially in the Arctic at the moment, uh, well, there are already uh, some, some wetland maps uh, used in this context, 
but only uh, wet or not wet. And this is definitely not sufficient. So something better is needed here and we need a community consensus on how we uh, represent this for these uh, global uh, methane accounts. And something that I unfortunately don't have time to go in further detail, something what we also work on with satellite data over land, it's uh, looking into what are actually impacts on biodiversity. So all this uh, thawing grounds, these changes in permafrost, they, they leave, this leaf, this leaves traces at the surface. It's changing the composition of uh, um, uh, vegetation communities. Uh, for example, here where these uh, reindeers are standing on this slope, this slope is an ancient uh, thaw slump and the, the, the bushes on this slope, they are a result of, or uh, a result from, from this thaw slump, they wouldn't be there if there wouldn't have been this thaw slump. So, the, and these changes, these patterns, it's something what we also can observe from satellites. And that's one of the, so biodiversity is also at the moment a big topic regarding climate change uh, in, in the Arctic. So we can, we can qu do quite a lot with satellite data uh, regarding thawing grounds. Uh, and we can go quite far back in time with comparably coarse resolution data, we can Main most inf important information is land surface temperature, so the thermal information. Then greenness and also albedo needs to be mentioned here, which gives us an account of uh, yeah, how uh, yeah, vegetation is, is changing. Um, if we want to go into the details, or actually we need to go into the details to uh, identify these disturbances, and for that, we need a higher resolution. Machine learning has brought uh, yeah, a lot of progress here. Um, and, uh, but you still, you need uh, sufficient processing facilities to process this huge amount of data. And uh, at some point in the end, you also need, uh, usually need uh, some, some workforce, some people uh, in addition. So machine learning can, or artificial intelligence cannot solve everything. Uh, and at the moment, at least. And what we also need in order to answer the big questions, specifically if it is about carbon, we need the expertise from uh, across the community, different types of expertise. We need to bring this together uh, in order to, to, to answer these big questions. Yeah, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to thank Isi for giving me the opportunity to present today. And I would like to add a special thanks to the graphics team from the European Space Agency. So all these uh, nice maps here, they are, they are made by them. And it, this, um, I think they are really great and they do a really fantastic job and it's really helpful for, for communicating science. Thank you very much, Annette, for this interesting and inspiring, excellent talk. At the beginning, I forgot to mention that I would kindly ask uh, attendees and participants to your presentation to put their questions in the chat so that I can read them out to you. Um, I have one question here. As permafrost thaws and greenhouse gases are released, I guess the expanding vegetation can bind some CO2. Question mark. Do we know what the relative magnitude of these two competing effects is? That's a question posed by my, co my colleague Mark Sargent from, from EC. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really good question that uh, we're on tries, we try to tackle. And it's um, it really depends on how much uh, of the carbon is uh, released and how quickly it is released. And uh, um, it, it really also depends on what the role or how the microbes uh, react to that, yeah, and how, how deep the thaw is and uh, to what depth microbes can, can act. Uh, so it, it's not, I cannot really answer this question. So this is something what we are still working on. And that's certainly something that we have to have to understand. Um, I had 
actually a question on machine learning, but then in your one but last or in the slide before the thank you slide, you basically answered it. But I let me come back to it just very briefly. You talk, it looked like as far as lake loss uh, is concerned, you, uh, you're, you're applying machine learning techniques. You seem to be fairly happy with the results you got as opposed to what was previously shown. And you said you would need workforce in the fields. And of course, you need in situ verification. Um, I, I just very briefly want to know what, what is your perspective for that as we get more data, but also data at better resolutions? And um, do you really see that uh, machine learning applied to higher resolution data might sort of uh, um, take care of some um, yeah, non-linearities is perhaps a bit too far, but, but what's your view on that and where do we go? Yeah. So, um... What is really, if you go to this higher spatial resolution, it's uh, something when you, you need to go get away from the pixel based uh, analysis and you need to, to um, consider the, the spatial patterns. So, what was uh, of the past addressed, like object oriented, and, and that's something what you can um, very nicely uh, address with uh, deep learning. So, that has yeah. been shown. So that that really gives uh, it, it's these these type of techniques are really important when when the spatial resolution is increasing. So it is really Thank helpful. You. But Thanks. still, still there is this there is information the information which uh, we cannot change the information in the satellite data. There is there is some uh, like uh, if vegetation uh, or. What we are looking at here for these applications that I've shown is removal of vegetation. Uh, and that can have various reasons that can many have mm -hmm. many different reasons. So it's not uh, and these reasons you don't see directly okay. in the satellite data. And that's there are also limitations here how you can automatically de derive it. So you in the end, you always need people to do some uh, manual interaction to clean up the data. So with uh, 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 like a big workforce of many people, I didn't re uh, really mean like people going in the field. I meant really people going throughout these results and looking into how are these results really reasonable. And at the moment, at this stage where we are, it's the, what we're getting out in the first moment from, from this uh, machine learning right. and so on, it's not delivering exactly what we need. So you still need to do something with it to get to a satisfactory result. Thank you very much for, for, for that answer. That, that's, that clarifies. I have two more questions here. Um, let me first read one out. And after I read the question from Johan Wadekamp, we come to Valentin Simeonov, uh, who's raised his hand. But first, a question from Johan Wadekamp. What fraction of the methane in the permafrost is present in clathrates versus solid organic carbon pieces? Uh, uh, unfortunately, I cannot answer this question. OK. That's so, yeah goes beyond my expertise i'm sorry <laughs> okay uh, then i'd like to ask valentin Simeonov to to ask his question valentin over to you but i'm afraid we can't hear valentin oh you're muted valentin you're muted but talking is permitted you need to unmute yourself okay okay hello thank you for the very interesting talk my question is related to the clot rates. Do we know the extent of the clot rates in the permafrost? And what is your comment about the Yamal craters that are caused by the release of methane from the methane clot rates? So actually, OK, I, that was the one slide I uh, took. I hide it to use the length of my talk. Um, yes. Okay, so there are um, these craters. Um, there is more than one. There are really uh, quite a lot which have been uh, discovered by now, and uh, they're quite impressive. Uh, like this one here, it was originally 80 meter deep, 30 meter wide. And that's uh, from, yeah, coming from the, uh, uh, yeah, old 
uh, methane deposits coming out. So they are in on Yamal, you have these uh, like Bovanenko gas field, you see in this infrastructure change map, you see a lot of that is red because of new built pipelines and uh, the Bovanenko railway. And so it's, it's a huge uh, gas uh, deposit field. And the, uh, there is now this, this, it's like a cover there, the permafrost layer in, in the ground. And uh, as ground is thawing, there is more, the probability is quite high that this methane can come out at certain places. And this is what uh, scientists think actually, the yeah, also, uh, Russian scientists uh, think that uh, this is, um, it's really triggered by, by climate change. And we have seen several hot summers uh, recently on Yamal. And specifically, there was this 2012 uh, very hot summer, which triggered uh, some thaw. A lot of landslides have been uh, triggered in 2012 due to that. And uh, also, most likely, this uh, great this crater here, what appeared afterwards, is a result of that. That there was uh, some path was open or the, it was a weakening of this uh, frozen ground layer that this, this gas could come suddenly out. So that's one of the, uh, uh, that there are also other theories here, but uh, it's thought it's most likely uh, we see this, this, these holes, these craters as a response to, to increasing ground temperatures. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks very much uh, for answering Valentin's question. I, I have a question here from Andrew Lasarevich, um, uh, who thanks you also, like several others have done already on the chat. So I want to say you got lots of compliments. And he asked, you noted that studies of carbon release from thawing permafrost are in early stages. What type of observations slash observables may be most useful so, to observations and observables? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what. Um... Well, we need a continuous uh, account from across the Arctic and satellite data are of course uh, a good means to get some spatially continuous information. But if you're talking about this carbon, it's it's in the ground in the soil. So we need uh, what we, we cannot look into the ground, but we couldn't use uh, land cover as a, as a proxy for soil conditions. And, and at the moment, there's no suitable, no good land cover yet available for the Arctic. And that's something what we are actually working on to get um, a better account. Well, there are these soil carbon maps. I've shown one, but they are they are rather imprecise. And then the question is, what is yeah? How much of that is coming out of of the soil? So so that's um, uh, on the one hand we need measurements from the concentrations in the atmosphere, and here the the satellites, well, there's some capability of satellites. There are some recent missions like Topomi and there are some planned future missions uh, there's like Merlin and so on, which will improve um, the way or improve the, the measurements of methane concentrations in the atmosphere across the Arctic. But it's still very difficult to assign this to where it is coming from. So and this is also something where we what we um, yeah, still uh, need some some research into that uh, where does how much uh, um, there's how much methane and co2 released and how does this uh, um, relate to the different moisture gradients that we have and then this this not these natural emissions they are mixed with the uh yeah like from us coming from these craters or by uh uh yeah gas by leaking by pipelines and so on. Actually, there's much, much more uh, methane uh, released into the at atmosphere at the moment due to human activities in the region from this, these gas uh, fields compared uh, to, to, to these um, wetlands. At least we have some, some really distinct point sources. These point sources can be identified from the satellite. And we, we have to learn how to, we have to distinguish these um, uh, artificial from the from the natural sources, and that's something where we are still still kind of at the beginning. Thanks very much for that. I have one raised hand here from from Mark Mark Sargent. Over to you, Annette. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we yes. can. 
Okay, thanks for the for the talk. Um, I think quite early on in your presentation, you showed a map of the geographical variation of CO2 concentration um, in the permafrost. Soil carbon, yeah, there was the soil carbon map from Gustav Hugelius, yes. Yeah. Right. Sorry. So, I mean, I, I'm not at all an expert of this field, but uh, I was, and that's why I was wondering sort of what determines the initial level in the first place. Uh, so yeah, yeah I, I saw that large mm -hmm. positive or, or high value anomaly to the south of Hudson Bay in, in mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. And was just yeah. curious what, what, what determines regional differences here. Yeah. So, okay, this is soil carbon. So this carbon doesn't really say anything about what is going into the atmosphere, but what can potentially go into the atmosphere as either methane or CO2. And this is coming from national or regional soil maps. It's an assemblage of maps. So if you would zoom in here at the border between Alaska and Canada, you would see a, a strong, it's a really a jump in there because and of the difference in the quality of the maps. And this is this is the, the, the problem. This is actually the issue here. So this is not from satellites. It's coming from some really generalized soil maps. Uh, which have been put uh, assembled together across the Arctic. And we urgently need uh, a better map. And this is where, how, where we now try to use um, land cover as a proxy for, um, yeah, where are these, these, where do we have uh, high amounts of carbon in, in the soil, at least near the surface, which can, uh, yeah, what is uh, then important for, um, yeah, methane or CO2 uh, emissions. So this map here, it's it's the first attempt. So that that's the map or that's the data set that everyone is now using because there is no other data set. And there is really room for improvement. So this Hudson Bay anomaly, it um, has something to do with uh, maps done differently. Uh, largely done differently across uh, from country to country. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Annette. Uh, not only again for this really inspiring talk, but oh no, there is another question. You see, uh, let me just check who that is. That is Anne Liefermann. Um, could you please, uh, yeah, Anne, over to you. I can't hear you, Anne. But your microphone's on. I don't know. Um, if you want to put your question in the chat, because we can unfortunately not hear you. Let me just see. Maybe it's a setting. I see that Anne's microphone is clear. Anna, oh, no, now she's muted. Now unmuted again. Ah, now I hear something. Anne, can you try to speak up? Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Perhaps there's a microphone setting which doesn't work, but I also do not see a question from Anne in the chat. Okay, let me let me try to ask a short question in between. Annette, you talked about the different wavelengths. You did say that you'd love to have more L band. And here, um, um, oh yeah, so Anne, Anne says she will directly write to you, Annette. But, but here my question, we will have soon an Explorer satellite launched with a P band. Mm -hmm. And um, even though I, um, I'm not so sure my, um, my question is really <laughs> scientifically sound, but would P band help you over L band? It's of mm -hmm. course a longer wavelength, but of course when it's getting yeah, there forward. have been some experiments by the U.S. colleagues uh, in Alaska with this, uh, airborne P band observations, and uh, they came up with some estimates, improved estimates of um, soil moisture and active layer thickness. Um, well, it's. To some extent, it, it, it really may help to get uh, a better account of active layer thickness. 
-hmm. but we will see. Okay. It really, well, we will see. It's it's a it's a very interesting sensor. It's a biomass vision, right. and um, yeah, and people have started to experiment with with PPENT here. But uh, so let, let's see. Okay, super. So the launch of biomass is not too far away. So uh, watch that space. Uh, meanwhile, I get the question from Anne here. My question is whether the Playard images were helpful for your work. Question mark. Would you have additional needs for images? Uh, both, yes. Actually, we just discussed this last week with our colleagues. So we have um, um, got uh, really great uh, play arts uh, acquisitions for the entire coast or, or large stretches of the coast along the Beaufort Sea, along the, the Mackenzie uh, Delta, where we, uh, you have really strong coastal erosion. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, uh, that's part of the Horizon 2020 project, Nuna Tayok. So, so this is the core area here where we're trying to develop a steam um, using actually Sentinel-2 to come up with um, uh, operational or kind of working towards operation and monitoring of coastal erosion. And uh, but it's 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 happening at the meter scale. So the playards are well, these higher resolution images are much more of, of value, and they have actually already been used. We have not uh, got yet to to or the, the study is not yet completed. It's still ongoing, and actually I've been asked by our uh, project partner last week if oh shouldn't we we, we need new, we need more data uh, this this summer. Should we, do you think we have a chance to, to get new acquisitions? So yes, we would like to have more. And now you have a lot of supporters on that um, uh, Game Changer seminar of ISI today uh, who all support you in this. So un, un, uh, uh, to your address, yes, please support Annette with, with more data. With that, um, it's seven minutes beyond the hour, and uh, I would like to thank you very much again, Annette, for a really inspiring talk about one of the big tipping elements in our climate uh, system, the permafrost. And um, to all participants, thank you for attending. And as you know, um, uh, Annette's talk uh, has been recorded and will soon be available on the Game Changers Seminar uh, page of the EC website. Uh, with that, I would like to thanks again to everybody and particularly to you, Annette, and uh, everybody a nice evening. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.